again. Another beautiful day to sit outside and read a good story. But again, it's so bright, I can hardly see, so I'm gonna have to go back to my magical Farthest Away Mountain Shades and read to you chapter 14. So, Dracomag seems to wish that there was a way that he could stand up straight in his cave and Deacon was invisible. Let's find out what happens. Another poem. Dakin ventured to peep out and up. She really couldn't see much except what looked like a mountain of the coarse cloth and leather and far, far up a vast area of hair, a jungle of hair from which the shores seemed to be coming, snores, excuse me, seemed to be coming. The candle was in a giant holder on the floor, not far away from her. Well, Drakabag was asleep, but where was Grog? She crept out and looked all around the cave as much as she could for Drakamag's huge body, and then she saw him. He was still firmly imprisoned in the ogre's enormous hand, which had fallen back on his knee. Only the creature's head stuck out from among the tree-like fingers. Dakin could see he was struggling to free himself, but it was useless. He was caught. If I had an axe, thought Dakin, I could chop his head off. And then she thought about doing it and added aloud, no, I couldn't, not really. It was no trouble at all to crawl under the heavy folds of Drakamag's clothes to get through to the entrance of the passage. His bulk was blocking most of it, but she got there by running along a sort of channel in his jacket and then dropping through a hole she found in it. The worst part was going along the passage itself. Very little candlelight could pass the sleeping giant, so it was pitch dark. She ran along as fast as she dared and soon came to a turning. As she rounded it, a blinding light hit her eyes. The evening sun reflected on the colored snow. She was out. What was more, the effect of the troll's magic bead had worn off and she could see herself again. And she reminded herself, be seen. She sat down in the mouth of the cave to think. Far below, she could see her own village Drakamag's dream plan for what he would do if the master were to go poof in the Livy pool was fresh in her memory. How easily she could imagine the panic and terror the ogre could cause if he ever showed himself on that side of the mountain. Far away it might be, but the ogre was big enough to frighten the life out of all of her friends and neighbors if he ever did come bounding down the slope, crashing through the trees of the wicked wood, taking the fields and the river in one great stride and then... Dakin shuddered. No, no, something had to be done. Something had to be done. But what? Dakin bit her lips and screwed her eyes shut. Think, girl, think. Everything depends on one thing. Who is the master? She had thought all, all along that Drakamag was, the, was, and Gra was his watchdog. He was certainly the biggest thing alive on the mountain, or rather in it, and all the decent creatures, the gargoyles and croak and the troll, were afraid of him. But there was something or somebody worse than poor, brutal, stupid Drakamag. He'd talked as if the master had made him and brought Graw to life. Nothing could be done, Dakin decided, until she discovered who this master was. An idea came to her. Her books of poems had helped her before. Maybe it could again. She took it out of her pocket and let it fall open. Evil can come in many a guise, and wrong advice confuse the wise. Three good heads are better than one, even though they be of stone. Almost before she'd finished reading, Dakin was on her feet and peering all around her. The sun was just about to start sinking below the horizon. She had much less than an hour before nightfall. She must work quickly. She was looking for the white trail she had kicked up in the morning, and coming, coming up from the back entrance to the gargoyles' tunnel. If Zog was right, and the colored snow witch slept all day in what Drakamag had called her hole in the ground, she wouldn't have had a chance to splash her magic colors around over the kicked up white snow. Yes, and there it was, and oh, oh heavens, she'd almost forgotten. She was so used to going barefoot that Graw had picked her up right out of her boots, which were still there, stuck to the yellow sticky snow. The short white trail below them must lead straight to the entrance to the tunnel, although she couldn't see it from here. 
Oh dear, oh dear, thought Dakin in dismay. How can I wade or kick or anything my way through this awful snow? Each color does a different kind of harmful magic. I managed it with boots to protect my feet, but now <sighs> the snow at the edge of the castle cave door happened to be purple. It was a particularly horrid sort of purple, really poisonous looking, and it seemed to be giving off a poisonous sort of smell. Dakin bent and sniffed at it from a safe distance. Oh yes, disgusting, and how strange, just like the smell of Gra's wing. The thought of stepping on it with bare feet gave Dakin the shivers, but what could she do? Every moment was precious. The sun's lower rim was already touching the far off horizon. This is the test then, she thought, stiffening herself. I must trust the Lithy Pool water. After all, Dracomag said it was so powerfully good that he had to build the cabin so he wouldn't have to look at it. She lifted her long, full skirts, took a deep breath, and stepped into the purple snow. It actually fizzled as her foot sank into it, and a cloud of evil-smelling purple steam rose up around her legs. Her feet felt very peculiar, but she certainly didn't feel any pain or anything else. And after the first few steps, she gained courage and walked boldly through, past the purple patch, into a navy blue patch where all the snow screamed the second her foot touched it. Through a green patch, the caterpillars formed under her feet, but scattered like slush under them as she walked. And a red patch, her feet smoked but were not burned, to the yellow. Here she could feel that sticky snow was trying to get a grip on her feet, but failing. And now she reached her boots. It was lovely to slip her cold feet into them. She took time to undo the laces and lace them up again tighter, and then she slipped down into the tunnel. Chapter 15, Who is the Master? She had no candle this time, and it was much harder climbing down than it had been climbing up. She slid most of the way and felt sure she would have been very badly grazed and bruised several times if it hadn't been for the magic of the water. The way was frightening and hard, but at last she was sticking her head out of the mouth of the cave on the other side of the mountain, where only this morning Drakamag had poked his finger, feeling for her. Zog, she whispered loudly. She saw a slight movement close by on the rock, and there was Zog's little face, all the carved lines upturned with joy at seeing her. Oh, he moaned with pleasure. You're back, you're still alive. Oh, tell me, tell me, oh no, wait. He turned his head the other way on his long neck and made a strange gurgling whistle. And then he said, I'm calling my brothers. You had better tell us all at once. But is it safe for them to leave their places? Nothing is safe, but at evening, Drakamag sleeps early. And sometimes when we are very lonely, we meet together and talk. Very soon, first Vog and then Og came sliding around the corner of the rock face. And soon the three of them, like so many disembodied gnomes, were close to her, rubbing their hard, cold little heads against her and moaning, oh, until she put her hands to their mouths in turn to silence them. Shh, she said, Dracomag's asleep, but you never know who else might be watching or listening. The gargoyles looked alarmed and their necks twisted this way and that as they peered around. Who, who, who? They asked after one after the other. Dakin sat down on the ledge and the brothers glided down to stay near her. Og and Zog rested their necks on her shoulders, and Vog, with a jealous look, nestled his head in her lap. Dakin petted him like a cat. Now listen, all of you, she said, using the very firm tone of her mother when she had something serious and rather stern to say. I see that we four are friends, and we are enemies of whatever the evil is that rules this mountain. No, now don't start awing straight away. We've got to be very serious, and we've got to think. The gargoyles all nodded their heads solemnly and she went on. Now, you told me several things that I've been thinking about. First of all, you, Zog, said that you gargoyles are only sentinels and that you know nothing. True, true, moaned Zog sadly. It is not true, said Dakin severely. To begin with, you all know the password. The gargoyles looked at each other. For another thing, Dakin went on, you know what it is that the troll stole. Now don't start fussing about what a deep secret that is because I already know that he stole the ring of kings. But why couldn't you have told me that? They all hung their heads. 
But the most important thing of all is that I believe you know who the master really is. At this, the gargoyles snatched themselves away from her and huddled all together, their necks entwined, their stone heads shivering so much that they grated together. She parted them firmly with her hands. Enough of that, she said. You'll chip each other's ears off. Now, do you want the evil spell taken off this mountain or don't you? We do, we do, moaned the brothers. Then you'll have to help me, even if it is forbidden, even if it is dangerous. I've taken risks and you'll have to take some too. Again, they looked at each other and this time they nodded slowly. All right, said Dakin. Now, first of all, the password. Og slid up close to her and whispered, Dragon's Fin. Oh, goodness. Is it still that? I knew that all the time. The troll said that it wouldn't have been changed, or that it would have been changed. She, he, never changes it, whispered Og. She, he, who? The witch? The gargoyles were huddling again. Og looked miserable with terror. Yes, yes, the witch. Shh, it's nearly dark, he said. She, he, uh, the witch will be waking up soon. But why are you all so afraid of her? I suppose the witch is a her. They didn't answer. The light was fading quickly now, and Dakin shivered herself. Croak told me she was harmless except for the magic colors she puts on the snow. Again, they were silent. Dakin suddenly felt very frightened. Could old Croak have been wrong? She remembered the poem, evil can come in many a guise and wrong advice confuse the wise. How many years has Croak been shut up in that cabin? Dakin asked. 200, they moaned. He has forgotten. He knows only what Drachamag tells him. He doesn't even know who he once was. They say, that's true, cried Dakin. Shh, the gargoyles hissed. But the witch, the witch can't be the master. Drachamag isn't afraid of her. He said he'd dig her out and make her eat all her snow. He called her old paint pots. Zog put his face to her ear and whispered, Drachamag himself doesn't know the truth. The witch is only a disguise. The master is the witch only at night. By day, we do not know what he is or where he is. That is the terrible thing. He's invisible, but his power, his voice can be anywhere on the mountain. He may be here now. The three of them huddled together, terrified. It was quite dark now, and the darkness seemed to press in upon them. Dakin suddenly, loving them more than ever, pulled them to her and cuddled their cold heads. Did the witch change you too? You weren't always like this. Gargoyles everywhere once, uh, w once were people or trolls like us, explained Og. We are lucky in a way. We're still alive and we can still talk and think and move a little. We can still feel, said Vog, and they all nestled closer to her and moaned, oh, very softly. Why? Why didn't you become like other gargoyles, just stone heads? Well, the master needed us to guard the mountain. He put us against the wall by the path. We're not allowed to meet together like this and talk. If he ever caught us, oh, we would be broken off and thrown down the cliff or turned into ordinary gargoyles, unmoving, ugly, and dead forever. Dakin gently pushed them away and stood up. In that case, she said, you must go back to your proper places. But before you go, is there anything else you can tell me that might be useful to me? From the darkness, she heard three voices, one after the other. You cannot harm the master by day. He is everywhere and nowhere. He is an evil spirit. He cannot be touched. At night, he becomes the witch. He, she, seeks the ring by the light of the witch's ball. Then he is visible. He has a body. He cannot melt into air until morning. The password will not protect you if he knows that you have come to save us. You must pretend you come with news of the ring. Then he will not harm you till he has it. But you said my troll stole the ring. Your troll, as you call him, is Gog, our fourth brother. 
He stole the ring at the christening of Prince Rally. He stole it because like us, he was in the master's power. He too was a flesh and blood troll then. And we all went to the christening on the master's orders. He told us that whoever stole the ring, the royal ring for him would be set free. Gog managed to slip it from the queen's finger as she was cuddling the baby and we were all pressing around to look. We four brothers ran with it back up the mountain, but on the way we began to quarrel. We knew that when we returned to the master, he would imprison us three again and let Gog go. It had been so lovely that day of freedom. We couldn't bear the thought of being heads of stone again, perhaps for another hundred years. So we quarreled with Gog and he ran away from us. And that is the last we ever saw of him. But we know that the master punished him from afar for he knew what had happened. And although he has no power except on the mountain, he sent a spell which turned Gog into a small brass figure, just as Gog came to the far side of the wicked wood. That's where we found him, exclaimed Dakin. And us he punished, as you see. And ever since then, for 17 years, he has been searching the wood by night, looking for the little brass troll who was our brother Gog. Oh, I do hope he got out of the wood all right, thought Dakin, and then asked aloud, why does the master, the witch, want the ring? Why is it so important? First, because it is magic. With that ring, he could take power over the whole country, not only this mountain. Also, said Vogue, without the ring, the prince cannot marry. It is the law of the land that the ring must be put on the finger of every royal bride. The royal family will die out without the ring, and since they are good and take care of the people, the master hates them. Now I understood, said Dakin. Thank you. You've been very brave. Now go back to your places. I'm going to look for the witch. Aha. Uh -huh. Next chapter is entitled The Witch, and it will wait for another day. How exciting!